Hallelujah, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, how are you this morning? I trust that you're filled with the Spirit of the Living Lord, that your heart is filled with joy, and that your mouth is truly filled with praises, because He is so worthy. Now, there are those who would say that the seven churches are represented in the seven days of creation. There are those that would say the seven churches are represented throughout the last 7,000 years. For, of course, you know that there were 2,000 years between Adam and Noah. There were 2,000 years between Noah and Jesus of Nazareth. And there are 2,000 years since Jesus of Nazareth to where we are today. The 7,000th year, many believe, will be the millennial reign. Now, I personally don't subscribe to those teachings. I can't find them in the Bible. But there are two that I do kind of lean toward. The first would be the placement of the seven churches. You see, if we read together in verse 11 of chapter 1, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And notice the order of the churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, I want you to take a look at this picture, and I want you to imagine yourself a missionary, and you've just departed the boat that's docked at the seaport, and you're going to begin at Ephesus and make your way around to each one of these churches in succession. So take a look at this picture and you may better understand what I'm talking about. Now you can see that in any other order than how the Lord has laid them out to John, it would make no logical sense along your journeys. But in this perfect order, it makes perfect logical sense to begin at Ephesus, move to Smyrna, then Pergamos, then Thyatira, then Sardis, then Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. But as I stated, there are two teachings that I subscribe to. The second would be that the seven churches, again, in perfect order, if they were in any other order, it would make no sense whatsoever. But in this order, we can see how historically accurate the seven churches play out through the last 2,000 years. Let me explain. Ephesus represents the apostolic church, the early church, the beginning of the formation of the church. And that took place from A.D. 30, to AD 100. From 100 to 313, we see the Roman persecution. And we know that the Romans persecuted the early Christians, especially in the Roman Colosseum. We are even told historically that they hung their bodies above the Roman Colosseum during the nighttime, lit them on fire so that they could watch the activities and the games that were taking place down on the ground in the center of the Colosseum. From 313 A.D. to 600 A.D., we see the imperial time period. This was the time of Constantine. Now, you have to understand historically what took place with Constantine. You see, we are told that Constantine became a Christian. Whether he became a true Christian or not is certainly debatable. But he took the name of Christianity, and he made Christianity the national religion. Now, this is important because anyone that held a job, especially a government-type job, had to convert to Christianity in order to maintain their positions in the government, working under the rule of Constantine. And so unfortunately, what many of them did was that they took the name of Christianity, but they still continued to worship their pagan gods. And so when you look into the Roman Catholic Church, because Roman is the first part of that, and that was an extension from what Constantine created in this time period, when you look into the Roman Catholic Church, you'll see these idols of Mary and Paul and Peter. But if you trace those back to the very beginning of Constantine's time, you'll find that Mary was once Isis. Peter, for instance, was Apollos. Paul, Zeus. 
And so what happened was, is they carried their pagan religions into this early Christian movement because they didn't want to quit worshiping their sun gods, their moon gods, but they took the name of Christianity. And so what began pure and unadulterated mixed with the corrupted and the pagan. And we can see much of that today. And just a side note, that's why Constantine created Sunday as the day of worship. It was to cater to those who had left their pagan religions, but didn't want to forsake and leave everything behind. The same with Easter and Christmas and other such holidays. Well, that carried up to 600 AD, and from 600 AD to 1517 AD began what would be the medieval time period. Now, this would be the Roman Catholic Church beginning to move into much more corrupt teaching like charging for the forgiveness of sins. And this is the very reason that Martin Luther began his protest against the Roman Catholic Church. We also have in this time period what history tells us of the Roman Catholic Inquisition. And basically what took place in that time period was exactly what you see with ISIS today, convert or die. And historians of the church tell us over 50 million were killed. And yet so many people want to point the finger at Hitler for being such a killer of five or six million when the Roman Catholic Church is said to have killed almost 60 million. And this is why many who read the book of Revelation chapter 17 speculate because we don't know for certain, but they speculate that this is speaking of the Roman Catholic Church. Look at verse 6. It says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Over 50 million, there would be much blood, friends. And those who died, died because they would not convert to Catholicism, but they stood true to the Protestant movement protesting the Roman Catholic Church. And so they would be defined as saints. It says, I saw this woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now you can read that chapter in its entirety, but I, along with others, lean to the idea that that is speaking of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, that time period ended in 1517. And from 1517 to 1648, we see the Reformed Church, the church that was brought about by Martin Luther's protest. And this is where we see many denominations spring up. And the church that we see today is much of what took place from this time period. So you could call this the Reformed time period or the denominational time period. Then from 1648 to 1900, we see the missionary time period, which is when many of the followers of Jesus branched out across the world and took the gospel into all the corners of the earth. And then, of course, we see the last church, Laodicea, being the apostate church. And that took place from 1900 to where we are today. And if you don't think the church is apostate today, you're not keeping up with what's going on. All you have to do is flip on to any of the major televangelist or Christian broadcasting networks, and all you'll hear is apostate teaching, false teaching. And so over the course of the next several mornings, as we discuss each of these churches, keep this in mind because it plays a very relevant part to our study. Well, with all that being said, I want to conclude today by looking at the church of Ephesus. And I not only want to look at the church of Ephesus in relation to how the church began its course, its journey up, up until the time that we're in right now. But I want us to remember that each and every one of us are called by the word of God, the church of the living God. And so I want you to look and see if you see yourself in this passage. Do you see these characteristics, these traits in your life? Well, let's look at what the Lord had to say about the church of Ephesus. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he who holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now we know that the seven stars are the seven angels that are placed over each of these churches slash time periods. And we know that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. We know this from chapter one, verse 20. 
Well, now look what he says. He says, I know your works. In Greek, that word works means steadfastness. I know that you're standing upon the word of God and you will not move outside of its boundaries. I know your labor, he says. Again, in the Greek, that means trouble due to your efforts. In your efforts to be obedient to the things of God, you're being persecuted because of it. And I know what you're going through, says Jesus. I know your patience. Again, this relates to the idea of steadfastness in obedience. And then look at what he says. I know how you cannot bear them which are evil. Do you remember in Psalm 15, it says, Lord, who will abide in your tabernacle? Who will dwell in your holy hill? He that walks uprightly. He that works righteousness. He that speaks the truth in his heart. He that does not backbite with his tongue. He that doeth not evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. But now notice this. He in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Do you know what that word contemned means in the Hebrew? It means despised. You despise someone who is vile, who is evil, who is practicing unrighteousness, who is not serving the Lord Jesus with full and absolute surrender. Now go back to Revelation chapter 2. He says, I know how you cannot bear them who are evil. You despise them. And that's a character and quality of God because God despises them. Does he offer his love unto them? Absolutely. But until they become his child, they're not a recipient of his love. They are his enemy. Verse 2 goes on by saying that you have tried them, which say they are apostles, and they are not, and you have found them liars. You're holding them and their teachings accountable to Scripture. You're calling them out. Why do not we see more of this today? Why are so many willing to bite their tongues? I can only assume it's because people are not aware enough of what the Bible says to be able to hold anyone else accountable. They leave it up to preachers and pastors thinking that that is their duty, but it is not their own duty. But friends, we have all been commanded to memorize, study the Word of God, conforming ourselves to it and living by it. He goes on in verse 3 and he says, You have borne or bared the burdens of others. You have had patience. You've been steadfast. You've been faithful in your obedience to my commands. And for my sake, you've labored and have not fainted. Well, these are all very good qualities in the life of the Christian, in the life of the follower of the Lord Jesus. And yet, as much as they are being commended for these things by Jesus, now look at what he says in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. You no longer have the passion that you once had. Friends, let me ask you a very honest question. Does this sound like you? Were you patting yourself on the back when we read the first three verses? But as we got to verse 4, you began to run and hide? We must be honest with ourselves. Do we still hold the same passion that we did the day that we met him? Are we as eager to go to church and fellowship with others? Are we as eager to pray and seek the Lord? Are we as eager to read our Bibles? Are we as eager to forsake the things of this world, to deny ourselves the pleasures that it offers? Are we as eager to separate ourselves from the things that we know brings dishonor to God? Our music choices, our movie choices, our television choices, our conversation choices, the choices of our habits. You see, Jesus is saying here, I'm glad that you're doing all of these things. But you have forgotten the most important thing, your first love for me. I mean, think about it like this. You're in the park, and on one side of the park, you see a couple, some young kids, and they cannot keep their hands off of one another. They think that they are in love, and yet they're very early in their relationship. Then you see another couple on the other side of the park, 
And although they're sitting with one another, they look like two strangers. And the reason for this is the couple on this side of the park, the young couple, they're in the midst of their passion for one another. But the other couple have been together so long, they don't appreciate one another and they take each other for granted. They have lost their first love. And that's what Jesus is telling us. And so he says in verse 5, Remember therefore from when you are fallen and repent. Go back to the moment you left your first love. Was it the day you stepped out of a church, out of a fellowship? Was it the day you quit reading your Bible? Was it the day you quit praying? Was it the day you started listening to rock and roll again? You started listening to country again? You started watching things you shouldn't be seeing again? You started looking at pornography again? What was the day that caused your fall? Was it the day you picked that bottle up again? You started doing those drugs again? Go back to that moment and repent and begin to do again the first works that you did when you first met me. Reading your Bible, praying, going to church, going to fellowship, spending time with others who love Jesus, sacrificing the things of this world that weigh so heavily upon your soul. Because if you don't, I will come quickly and I will remove you out of your place. Now, as we have pointed out many times in our time together, this is just another passage that absolutely destroys the idea of once saved, always saved. Because Jesus says you will be removed from your place if you don't repent. And you can't repent and go back to your first love if you never had that love to begin with. So what he's saying is that you were one time saved, but you're not saved anymore because you're not continuing in your obedience and in your faith. You have lost your first love. And then finally he says, you have taken on the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were false teachers. They were those who put the doctrines of men before the doctrines of God. This might remind you of the Pharisees. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. And we have many men who are standing in the pulpit today that are Nicolaitans. And we have many Christians that are sitting on pews that are Nicolaitans. They're not adhering to the doctrine and teaching of God. They're adhering to the doctrine and teaching of man. And Jesus says, stop it. And then he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is crying unto the churches. The Spirit is pleading with you to repent. Oh friend, why do you hesitate? To him that overcomes, that repents, that returns back to his first love and maintains that steadfastness, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life, friends, represents eternal life. We will never die. We will eat of the tree of life. That's why Adam and Eve had to be expelled from the garden before they partook of it, because if they had eaten of the tree of life, they would have been eternally bound in their sinful deeds. And so although they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were cast out of the garden before they could eat of the tree in life. But we have been promised those who will continue in our obedience to the Lord and we will remain in our first love to him and we will remain in our first love for him. We will eat of the tree of life and spend eternity in his blessing, in his favor, in his presence. Oh, friends, do you know him today? Have you left your first love? Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of repentance. Listen to what he says in Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears these words, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's offered to you today, friend. Repent of your sin. Return unto your Lord. And live faithfully before him all the days of your life. I love you, friends. Now, as Yahweh wills, and until tomorrow, I'll see you on the next video.